Mike, over the past week, two studies came out that looked at antibody production in people infected with SARS-CoV-2. One was conducted in, in China and the other in Italy. And there was some concern about what these studies revealed about immunity and how long it lasts. Did these studies add more mystery to the issue of immunity? Well, immunity clearly is the word of the week, if not the word of the year. We all want immunity against this virus. And as I discussed earlier, uh, the idea that we are trying to achieve herd immunity, the 60 or 70 percent, with no pain, with no illness, with no death, the only way to get that, obviously, is a safe and effective vaccine, which we're a long ways from yet. Uh, the other way to get it, of course, is through ha experiencing the infection and uh, hopefully having a mild case and developing a, a type of durable immunity long term. Well, where are we at on that? We've known for some time from the coronavirus work that was done with MERS and SARS that immunity may actually be something that can be achieved for a short period of time, but long term is fleeting. Uh, we know that that the immunity response is a very complicated one. There are different kinds of antibodies that are involved. The T cells in our body are involved and how they interact is not completely clear. Uh, so you really have two things happening. One, what is the quality of the immune response I have today? Will it protect me? And or how long will it last and protect me? And that is the challenge. So these two studies really were an attempt to look at at least some initial data on people who might have had milder illness or who were asymptomatically infected. The first study from China, which was published in Nature Medicine, looked at 37 asymptomatic individuals who were PCR positive. And so they knew that they were infected, but remember they were asymptomatic. When they looked at virus-specific IgG levels, the type of antibody that uh, is long-term protection, they were significantly lower in the asymptomatic group, uh, right up uh, close to the time that they likely were infected, than the, a comparable symptomatic group in their acute phase. So what this means is that if you were sick, you made better levels of antibody uh, that would expect to be protective. 40% of the asymptomatic individuals actually became IgG negative in the convalescent phase. So from this standpoint, it's an issue of the sensitivity of the test. There still could have been IgG antibodies there specifically to uh, SARS-CoV-2, but they weren't detectable, which is not something we'd like. We'd like to have them detectable. Um, even 12.9% of the symptomatic group in their convalescent phase lost detectable IgG antibodies. So what we saw here really was that the asymptomatic infected individual also had lower levels of 18 different pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines, chemicals that are very key to the response that we uh, see with regard to infection. Uh, some of these cytokines are very important in helping to uh, enhance and direct the immune response to killing the virus. They also, of course, can be part of what we call the cytokine storm, which is a bad thing. But what these data really give us is pause to think about, are we going to be watching a situation where we won't have detectable protection over a period of time? And we surely have viral infections like that, where we may get short-term protection, just as we have ones where we get very long-term protection. A second study was published in Neurosurveillance, which was actually from a group uh, in the Lombardy region of Italy, uh, and they were in the Lodi red zone which was 10 municipalities that were really in the hot, hot zone during the uh, large outbreak there in, in March and April. And they recruited 390 blood donors from this, local, this area. And they were all recruited after February 20th uh, when the virus would have been circulating. And they found that overall, 91 of the 390 or 23% were antibody positive and could be reproducibly shown to be antibody positive. An additional 17 had evidence of viral RNA, i.e. the tests showing that they had been infected for 4.3 additional percent. Overall, they then had, because of this, uh, 108 out of 390 were positive. And when they followed up with this group, they saw the very same things that we were talking about with the Chinese study, that they too actually had this loss of antibody presence over time. 
Another important observation was that the majority of the neutralizing antibody positive blood donors appeared to have lower antibody titers than did the actual uh, patients who had this, not different than what we saw in China. And they suggested in this uh, observation that based on it, that, that it might be very well that the severity of symptoms may be a key determinant for mounting these neutralizing antibody levels. Uh, and in that regard, they suggest maybe treatment with plasma hyperimmune globulin, which we've been, all been talking about may help, but also raising the question about just how long such antibodies might last in pre- people who have milder illness. And I think the underlying challenge we have here is we don't have what we call a correlate of protection. That is a measure that says it's like inches or pounds or it's a, you know, a gallon. You know what it is. And in this case, what we'd love to have is a, a marker, an antibody level, uh, something that we can measure to say, yep, this is a quality of protection. If you have a lot of this, you're protected. If you don't, you're susceptible. We don't have that yet. And we don't know, uh, for example, anything about the T-cell responses here. Again, that cellular immunity, which may play a very important role in this. But I think these are all, in a sense, kind of warning shots that we have to be very, very careful in making assumptions that they will, we will have durable immunity or that it will uh, protect us uh, from not only uh, illness, but from infection. We may not get a vaccine like that. We may ultimately get a vaccine one day that reduces the severity of illness. Uh, that by itself would be great. It would mean that we'd sure have a lot less fewer hospitalized people or, or people who die. But we have a lot more to go here. And, and I think that uh, this is just a reminder why we have the challenges we do uh, with the vaccines we have. And let me say, last but not least, um, none of these studies reported actually including people who have underlying health problems. We know from the influenza world that vaccine response can be heavily dictated by underlying health issues. Of one example, if persons with obesity respond uh, not nearly as well as people who are not to an influenza vaccine. So we have a lot more to go here. We need a lot more information on neutralizing antibodies. We need a lot more information on how the T cells work. Uh, And this is going to be an area that uh, I can't emphasize enough how high priority it is that we get this kind of information. And and the people who are doing the research on vaccines understand that. This is not a revelation at all. It just is also a reminder to the public that this is not going to be easy. It's just not going to be easy. But at least this work is now beginning. So, Mike, can some of these questions be answered in the various clinical trials that are going on for the potential vaccine candidates? Well, they can be answered to the extent that um, we can look at what happens in terms of immune response to the vaccines. But we won't really understand the actual effectiveness of these vaccines until we go through time and people get exposed to the virus. And then at that point, we'll see how well they work. Uh, The other thing we won't know is their durability of protection. Uh, We may have a vaccine that for the first year works quite well. Uh, The second year works so-so, and by the third year, what protection was provided is gone. That's not that dissimilar to what we see with things like influenza. So that's going to take time. Now, we don't have time right now, so we're going to obviously move forward making assumptions that if we even get short-term immunity, it's worth it to move this vaccine and to get it into people. This is where when we talk about the course of normal vaccine research, often taking a decade or more, that's the kind of studies we would do and say by the end of year four or five, what was the level of protection that was there? And we're not going to have that here. Uh, that's not a safety concern. It just means we may find that, you know, we're going to have to vaccinate people, uh, you know, every year, every several years, even if we do get a successful vaccine. 